All right. Uh, well, hello and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for our third uh, in a series conversation about the Microsoft Power Platform Advantage in the EHS market. Um, today, we have uh, two esteemed uh, guests um, on, the, on the show. Uh, one is uh, William Pennington. He's a research director at Verdantix, uh, a leading um, market research and analysis firm that tracks the um, environmental health and safety markets among many other markets. And he'll tell us a little bit more about what they do and what areas they look at. And we, of course, have a returning guest, Trevor Nimgears, the CEO of iTrack365, um, uh, a leading uh, EHS software provider that is uh, built on the Microsoft Power Platform. And, um, and he'll talk about some of his experiences as well um, in digitizing EHS. So let's get started. Um, first, let's start off with some intros. Um, you, know, you know, Bill, uh, can you just tell a little bit about uh, yourself, your role at Verdantix, and kind of what Verdantix does um, and what you're seeing in the market that you're looking at today. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Vinay. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, I am the EHS Research Director at Verdantix. So Verdantix is an independent market research firm. We do research in several areas, um, them being smart buildings, operational excellence, ESG, and the practice I'm in, which is environmental health and safety. Uh, and we really look at uh, technology strategies, digital strategies for corporates and for vendors uh, to better optimize their performances, to, to kind of reach the right people um, and understand really what's available in the market. And, you know, the, the past 18, 24 months has been a really um, crazy time, I think, for the world, but it's also been a pretty crazy time for EHS. Uh, so there's a lot of different kind of high level trends we've been seeing. And it, a lot of it really has to do with COVID-19. So um, or they existed before COVID-19, they've, they've become even more apparent after COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, I can talk a bit more onto these, but, but really one of the key things we've seen is that COVID-19 has highlighted that EHS technology or digital technology isn't a nice to have anymore. It's a must have. Right. If you don't have EHS technology, you can't, uh, you know, ensure that your workforce is as safe as they could be. Um, you can't ensure this business continuity or build this business resiliency. And you're all, overall, your company is going to suffer uh, and your workers are going to suffer. So uh, we've definitely seen that become kind of the mindset of EHS professionals. Uh, and we've seen that become the mindset of executives as well. Um, so, you know, EHS has been pushed into that executive suite. You know, back in the, you know, maybe two years ago, maybe you wouldn't find a CEO who knows what, PPE is or personal protective equipment. Uh, but now that that phrase is, you know, common among households even. Um, so it's, it's really highlighted the value of EHS uh, to ensure, you know, workers um, aren't exposed to COVID-19. And if they are, how you manage that effectively. And that without a strong EHS program, there's no business continuity. And executives are recognizing that. Uh, they're uh, pushing budgets towards that now that they recognize it. And it's becoming more of an integral pillar of, of companies more so than it was maybe 18 months ago. And I have a lot more to talk about, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll let Trevor um, answer a question or two and then I can uh, can expand even more. No, yeah, and sometimes it's, it's unfortunate. Sometimes it's, it's something like a you know, pandemic has to happen before you know people start to really realize it. I remember when I was in the EHS industry trying to elevate EHS as an executive priority and it was mm -hmm. it never made the agenda. So it's made and it's amazing to hear that this is starting to happen. Um, yeah, I don't know, yeah. if you're able to see that as well, like in some of your interactions with customers, yeah. are, you, are you starting to notice some stuff accelerate now? Yeah, for sure, Vinay. And um, you know, just in way of introduction, my name's obviously Trevor uh, Nimigears and I I run a a software firm that's really hyper focused in the space around EHS and 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 the growing space that EHS is really attending to, um, which is is growing and, and kind of evolving in, in many of the things that we'll talk about. Um, but but to the point about you know what's going on trends that we're seeing, you know certainly one of the beliefs that we have is there's a fundamental trend about how people are looking at embedding EHS into everything that they do, into all aspects of the organization. And, and that's where, you know, when we, um, when I joined this company, you know, uh, seven years ago when we acquired it, 
we came in really understanding that it seemed like there was a shift around these platforms. And, and that's really the theme of our, our topics, you know, we're, we're coming back to is there, people are starting to make investments in EHS in a different way because it really addresses people across the whole organization. So that's one thing we'll get more into, but you know, certainly as we address the market, we talk to our customers, COVID-19 has kind of changed the, the mix where EHS used to be kind of a little silo that sat in, in one area of the business where, hey, there's high risk. Well, now you've got risk um, distributed across the business with office workers, not just people who are doing dangerous tasks in a field environment. So what we've started to see is this trend around what we call, you know, and, and I think Verdantix, you talk about it as medium risk industries, um, where those is, risks are, um, they might not be, um, at, you know, the, the danger of, of, of running on a construction site tower or, a, um, you know, a large piece of equipment, but it's danger and, and hazards that need to be mitigated all the same and for the health and safety of your entire um, organization. So that shift is, is really interesting because it's changing the dynamics of how EHX is actually deployed and how it's used in an organization. So, so again, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, some very, very, um, in, in some ways, yeah, obviously a tragic thing with that's happening with COVID-19, but I think it's waking people up to saying how we can operate better and, and take better care of our people. And uh, ultimately that's what, what we've always been after. And, and we look forward to doing uh, more of that with uh, uh, the help of uh, uh, customers out in the industry. And just to, to add a little bit to that, Trevor, I think you made a really good point about, um, you know, uh, workers in the office or, you know, maybe it's not process safety risks, you know, in an oil and gas firm, which we're all aware of. Um, but there's definitely been, uh, as you mentioned, there's a growing focus in those medium risk enterprises. There's a growing focus in these mid market and small to medium enterprise firms because they're recognizing, you know, safety is a consistent concern and need across any company. You have two people or you have uh, 200,000 people in your company, um, workers being safe, uh, going home at the end of the day, then that should be the number one priority. And, uh, you know, someone in the office might not have the same issues or same safety risks associated with someone who's working in a chemical plant. But there's also been a rise of, you know, COVID-19, obviously exposure, but recognizing things like mental health and wellness of workers, yeah. which is definitely a huge focus in the past 18 months exacerbated by COVID, existed beforehand, but exacerbated by COVID, and how these, you know, digital solutions or ways that you can engage the workers can actually support them in that way. So, you know, all of these intrinsic um, and soft risks that we weren't really aware of um, that affect everybody, you know, how is software, EHS software going to support them? And, and that's become a lot more to the forefront. I think uh, EHS managers are recognizing that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see it too, Bill. And I, I think it's, as simple as, you know, you've got hybrid workplaces, you've got people working from home. Um, the concept of an employee check-in, um, you know, around mental health and comfort and, and connecting with the organization was something that I think two years ago would have been kind of laughed out of the conference room because it just didn't seem like it was necessary. Now, when you don't see your people regularly, you need to have a way of doing that. And EHS software has always been good you know, just like financial software has always been good at managing your PL and your balance sheet, that's all good. EHS software is, it has always been at the forefront of trying to deal with some of these softer metrics in an organization and gather information. And I think COVID-19 has just highlighted a bunch more of those that all of a sudden people say, hey, this is a natural place where um, software companies in this industry can actually lead us down a path. And we're seeing that even with areas like ESG, right? There's new opportunities coming there. Uh, which certainly is something we can talk more about. But uh, Vinay, we'll let you ask some more questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, mean, this is great. I mean, I think I think we need to spend some time on here because I I, I do think uh, you know uh, there's a new normal, and I as much as I hate saying that over and over again, but like in, in EHS, there's definitely a new normal as this elevation into the C-suite has happened. You know, uh, Trevor, you and I had some discussions with 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 Ryan as well, Cunningham from Microsoft, to, to talk about you know. EHS really being the siloed, you know, um, separate system and, it, and, and the barriers to real true adoption as a result of that. So we, we keep talking about connected application ecosystems and really connecting EHS into that. Um, and, and Bill, you know, when we look at some of the stuff you've been writing about and, and talking about, you talk a lot about connected safety ecosystems and, and, and you evangelize that concept. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about what that concept is and, and how do you see that really you know, accelerating uh, in, in a world where it's been elevated into the C-suite? Yeah, of course. And you know, the, the concept of connected safety, I think, has floated around for, for a little bit. Uh, but when we think about what connected safety is, it, it's kind of two parts. It's the fact that safety isn't uh, you know, a siloed process. Safety is a part of everyone's work. It's a part of every business unit. Um, and uh, technology-wise, uh, you know, there is the best way to visualize that and understand that is by connecting all of the pieces together. Um, so we've seen a growth of software, as we mentioned. You know, we're talking a lot about software, and that's that's grown pretty drastically over the past four or five years. But we're also seeing a rise of IoT devices or new edge technologies, um, wearable devices uh, for things like ergonomics or fatigue monitoring. Again, this kind of goes back to these soft risks we never really realized um, or never had the data for, which we're able to get now from these wearable devices, but also um, connecting to different business units, operational data. You know, if you think about process safety, um, you know, you want to have the insights into what your assets look like as well, or, you know, quality might play a role into it. So it's kind of connecting all of these different business units the different workers and using technology to create a, a connected ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, the best way to understand like safety is to democratize it. So it's to, it's to kind of make sure that it's managed at that end user and every user within the, the company and technology is gonna be that solution. Uh, and you know, thinking about how, and if we look at safety, maybe it's this uh, big globe with a million points that all touch each other. It's this connected ecosystem, a holistic approach to it. Um, so we're seeing that, um, and I think COVID-19 has actually accelerated that, um, you know, that, that step in that direction. So, so, so definitely we're seeing that need for safety to be connected into the core operations of the business. And Trevor, this is something that you evangelized quite a bit, right? I mean, when you, when you uh, brought I try, I try 365 to the market, it was really about that connection into their application ecosystem, ecosystem, especially the Microsoft ecosystem. Can you tell us how you've been able to enable some of your customers to to connect safety into the core of what they do? Yeah, this was a, a kind of a, a very early building block of, of us getting into this space is, is a, a trend that we believe for a long time is that companies, when they look at their technology stack, if everybody's learned that if you have every kind of system under the sun, you end up with a really large problem. You mm -hmm. get, you're trying to connect everything to everything and it's simply not, uh, conceivable to be able to do that. So companies, I think in the last few years, and especially with the move to the cloud, have started to say, standardize on kind of core stacks of software that they say that they need to build on. And, you know, we talk about platforms. So the fact is a lot of companies, you can go to them and you can say, well, what kind of company are you? And they'll actually tell you, hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Salesforce company. I'm a, a Microsoft company. I'm a ServiceNow company. I'm an SAP company. You'll hear a whole bunch of answers like that, but that's because they've tried to build the building blocks and then extend out from there. And what we've tried to do is, is really, you know, build a solution with that in the, in, 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 in the back of our mind saying companies have made an investment. They want to extend that investment. They want to take it further and they want to really, you know, um, uh, you know, upsize that so that it, it reaches and, and they get the most from an investment, but it also reaches the most users. So that's where, you know, we've really focused on it from a platform standpoint capability. And then, you know, to some of the comments that Bill made too, is about connecting it and, and even about every employee needs to use it. We talk about the concept of embedded safety. To me, it, it, it's not a separate, and if you have a separate system, it naturally kind of has to, you have to get a licensing model for the separate system. You have to build the integrations into the separate system. You have to share data in the separate system. Well, if you take a platform approach, you say, how am I going to put it in that platform? That platform's ubiquitous in, in my company already. Now, how do I extend it? And then you can change the conversation into how do I embed safety into that operational process over here? How do I embed it over here? And it really changes the nature of how the company actually, you know, brings that kind of capability to their to their office workers, their field workers, and, and even the visibility that their executives and their management teams, because they're seeing data in a brand new way in a very integrated fashion. Um, so yeah, so just some, some amazing connections that are starting to happen, but, you know, we've all kind of 
believed for a long time been sold a bill of goods about getting that one system, that one kind of system. Well, I don't know that we'll ever get to one, but the frameworks are starting to get us towards a way where one data source, one integrated approach is, is really much more achievable. Yeah, and I think Trevor, that's a good point too. Is as you were saying, you know, embedding it into all the processes is, is how you how you know you ensure safety is is managed and accurately you know accurately with that throughout the company. And the number one thing that we see uh, that kills off any kind of EHS program is lack of usability. So anytime a worker sees something that they have to do for safety and it affects their job or it makes it harder to do in any way or it's something new to learn. Uh, that that is a major drop off in adoption, usability, and ultimately you're going to have bad, uh, you know, EHS metrics. Um, no one's going to be happy. So to have an effective EHS solution, it needs to be something that they don't feel is going to affect or disrupt their day too much. Gotcha. So having yeah. a comfortable UI, having something that they're comfortable using, something they don't need to switch between multiple platforms to use. I mean, yep. this is this is key, and we've seen this sync multiple EHS programs at different companies. And, and this is like interesting when it comes to usability, because I want to talk about the user engagement piece uh, next, but when it comes to usability, you know, we see, at least I remember seeing, um, you know, the use of Excel, the use of in, you know, in-house ad hoc systems, just basically coming out of that, um, that user need to, you know, to be able to control, you know, the EHS program, you know, instead of going and buying a system that they have to adapt to, you know, they just go and spin it up in Excel and maybe put it into an access and, and, and like, it's better than paper, sure. But that seems to be where a majority of customers are, that a lot of the process still sit in the systems. And so, you know, you, you, do you see that a lot in your research? Do you see that people are doing this and, and, and why they're doing this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we still see, you know, we talk about a, a growth of digitization and adoption of software and that's happening, right? But people are still predominantly using Excel. Um, even companies that do have EHS software to an extent are still using Excel for certain processes. Maybe those they feel um, you know, can't be handled by the software they're using. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very common and it's, it's really, you know, there's, a, there's three reasons why I think it's, uh, companies think they're very unique. Um, so they think that what they're doing is unique and they need something that they have to build up from themselves. Um, which, you know, th there's truth in it to a degree, you know, vernacular might be different, but you're most likely doing the same industry practices that your counterparts doing. Um, and software typically, um, you know, has, a, you know, a way to handle that. So people think they're unique, so they develop their own Excel files. They're also comfortable using it. People have been using Excel for, what, decades now, I guess. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so they're used to using it. They think they have a lot of control over it. Um, so, you know, that's something that they feel, um comfortable with ultimately. So, I mean, that's, that's one of the key reasons why, and the cost associated with it. I mean, that's always a piece. It's always going to be a piece as they think that they can build something. It's going to do the same, um, you know, thing that a software would do for just how many hours I have to put into it. Uh, so we still see a lot of people using Excel. Um, many times they don't recognize that, you know, when you use something in Excel, that, that, data is ultimately siloed to a degree and you're not gonna get the same value you're gonna get out of it. And what happens when you have to switch through 15 different Excel files uh, you know, to, to figure out something, it's, uh, it just kind of, it ultimately adds cost time um, usability and uh, it's just hard to break out of that, you know, yeah. that thing you've been doing for so long, it's hard to break out of it. When you see the benefits, I think people kind of have this oh wow moment of, uh, uh, this would be a lot better and for us, for my workers, and and you know, for me, my job will be easier. So yeah, yeah. I mean, and Trevor, you have a lot of experience with this. Obviously, because you're 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 dealing with a lot of folks that have made a significant investments in Microsoft and in Microsoft systems, including Excel. I mean, how have you uh, seen this trend, um, and and how have you been helping them? Because you you have an ability to connect in there much more deeply. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of how you've been helping your customers with that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm stepping out too far here by saying Excel is probably the most widely used technology tool in the world mm -hmm. in terms of people because it gives you that flexibility and, and all of those things. But, you know, Bill, you make good points about, you know, it, it, as soon as you create an Excel sheet at some level, it's naturally siloed. Um, you know, how many times and we talked about this in some of our previous calls 
um, do you go into a meeting where everybody's debating about the data? Yeah. Like that, and you're debating about whose data is right because it's naturally siloed. So you looked at the problem slightly different. And if you don't have consistency about data, your argument, you know, 55 minutes of your 60 minute meeting is arguing who's got the right data. And then maybe you get into the conversation about what you should be doing about the data. And that ultimately is when we look at it, we, we try and deal with that problem. So cloud software has got us towards, um, you know, uh, a, a centralized place where you can store things. Extensions with the Microsoft suite allow us to link into things like Excel. We have some processes that literally start in Excel where you do data entry there, and then it evolves into uploading that and, and linking that into your data model in, you know, in, in the Power Platform. Um, so you're extending on both sides to kind of connect in a different way. And I think that's, again, where companies kind of start to see the benefit. And, and you get back to that thing about the uniqueness, you know, Bill, that you talked about. The, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in the 80-20 rule that yeah. if you can come in with a software solution that deals with 80% of the requirements, you're going to get you're going to be able to get to a place where you have that common data set across the organization and then give each business unit the 20 percent ability and have a platform that allows you the flexibility to embed those business rules that, by the way, the 20 percent is really important. That sometimes stops people coming from using that software. So if you can actually have an approach that allows you to do both, you're going to get into a really rich place where you get strong adoption, because, you know, again, when you come back to this. If you don't get adoption of these tools, what's the point, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, our goal is always to get, you know, very high adoption, you know, to, you know, drive deeply into every part of the organization and not say, hey, you know, we had a safety incident. It's the EHS manager's fault. He's part of the organization and, and, and personifying it into every part of their business process. So you got to have that connection um, if you're going to make it work well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and speaking of that, of engagement adoption, I mean, this is like the second, you know, we talked about the connected application systems and EHS being a silo, right? And, and that kind of being a barrier to, to widespread success in the EHS programs. But the other one that I, I witnessed a lot was just on user engagement, right? Getting users to engage and participate in the program um, and really embrace the safety culture that these organizations are trying to go for. Um, and uh, the challenge is, again, when it's like another tool or another application on their phone, um, it just becomes something that gets ignored and, and, and oftentimes just, it's the job of the EHS manager to go and try to police the participation into the program. And it's never real in those, in those scenarios, right? And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have been noticing um, is that, you know, connecting into tools that they already use, collaboration tools that they're already collaborating with, you know, to not only like consume information, but to share information about safety to the broader organization and connecting with, you know, workforces or parts of the workforce that traditionally are not sitting in front of a desk looking at tools all day, right? And so this is a big, big topic area. And and, and, and Bill, I don't know, what are you seeing this as being an issue in, 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 in as a barrier of adoption in, in the market and, and how are companies getting past this? Yeah, no, I fully agree. And, and I think that usability is a, is a big piece for engagement. And, you know, as you were mentioning, this two-way line of communication um, or these tools that they're comfortable with, you know, if we think about safety in the realm of like behavior-based safety or like, you know, what we'd say maybe dynamic risk management where it's, you know, managing risk at the point of risk. Um, the best way to do that is to ensure that your employees are engaged that they understand you know, how to work safely and that they're communicating with others. Uh, and the biggest reason why we don't see that happening now is it's because maybe they have to pull out a different mobile application and put some things into it. Maybe they're not comfortable using it because um, they only use it for that specific thing. Maybe they only use it for that um, assessment that they have to take or an observation. So they're not used to using it. And that's a big, that's a big issue because, uh, you know, you want to find where there's the incidents, but you also want to have this communication between the workers, their managers, maybe the executives. There's that lack of visibility that we're seeing a lot. Um, so I think, you know, using these engagement tools that they're commonly using, they feel a lot more like they're a part of the process. Uh, they feel like they're, uh, they're, they're you know, their concerns are being heard because they can see it directly, you know, being responded to. So yeah, I mean, engagement's definitely become such a, a big thing for us. Uh, we're recognizing it across uh, across all of the industries, but right now the tools that they have 
are silo tools in, 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 in a sense. Even those that are EHS software with an associated mobile app is still a siloed tool essentially because it's still just sitting on that software. So um, it's kind of overcoming those challenges with a you know, more usable way, a more comfortable way for them. Um, and ultimately that's gonna be the most successful way to develop behavior-based safety. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, and I remember from my days, I mean, I remember we were lucky if we can get you know, uh, the general in- employee population to engage at least on a monthly level, we're lucky in terms of reporting mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, and, and Trevor, when you, you and I were talking in a previous show, we talked about some of the experience that you're seeing with your customer base. And, and, and I was surprised to see you know, weekly engagement if not higher um, in some of the, um, in some of your customer base, what, what are you doing in there um, to get them to be more engaged um, uh, with safety uh, using, using the iTrap solution? Or what, what are some of the things that you're, you're, you're bringing to the table there? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's really interesting to assess that because, you know, I, I think across the industry, it seems like if you can get 20 or 30% adoption, that's good enough. And, and when we look at the problem, we just say that isn't good enough. We need to be, you know, 80, 90 percent. We, we look to have, you know, nearly every employee somehow engaging in some of these processes, you know, daily, weekly, certainly monthly, as often as we possibly can. And we do that, obviously, so that we can get the processes used and they can, they can adhere and comply with the things around safety. Um, but we also do it so that the companies know that they're getting good value from the technology that they're buying. Um, so really driving that deep into the organization is really a key thing that we think about. I totally agree with you on, on Bill on, on the side of usability, right? If it's not usable, people aren't going to use it. And if there's too many, so you have to have some centralized process and, and things like that. But the thing I'd add to that too is accessibility is, you know, accessibility means a lot of things, but the way, the way I'm using it here today is really saying, put those tools, embed them into places where they already are. So if they're using something in Excel and they could have the freedom to build out part of their process in Excel and you can import that and bring that in, that's powerful. Um, Let's talk about other tools like Microsoft Teams. It's, you know, what is it now? 150 million active users every day or some enormous number like that. Well, we were 18 months ago when the pandemic started, we embedded iTrack inside of Microsoft Teams. So you're not going to a separate place where you're trying to go do something safety. Um, Not to mention, by the way, that, you know, hey, if you've got a list of safety incidents and all the process that you'd expect with that investigations, all the things like any good EHS system is going to do. But there's a whole level of stuff that's even soft collaboration around it. So now you take that incident, you layer it inside of Microsoft Teams, you have a channel set up for your organization to collaborate when something unfortunate maybe does happen in your organization you want to bring all the best and brightest together to discuss it well now it's not again a leap from one system to another it's right inside of something you know which is you know quickly become one of the most ubiquitous um, um, collaboration tools in the world so that to me is where you're going to start to get adoption and and things like that and and usability just becomes part of, of, of that key, you, 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 you use the usability of teams and you just kind of embed your piece to kind of go along with it. And that I, I think is, is where you really get some game changing um, shifts from adoption of 30% up to adoption of, of 90% of your staff in a, in a very regular, um, you know, on a regular basis, you know, daily, weekly. Yeah, yeah no, that's no, a no. really good, I'm sorry, yeah, but I, sorry, I just think ahead, that's no. a really good point. Yeah, we talk about, um, to build safety culture, safety needs to be embedded and yeah. it needs to feel like it's a part of your everyday job. And what a, what a better way to do that is every time you're doing your job, you see the safety component to it instead of having to pull out a different application, you know, app overload that we hear. So I think that's a really, really good point, Trevor, is, um, you know, when it's embedded in Teams, you're always seeing safety throughout everything you're doing. And it's going to be top of mind when an incident occurs that you should follow this process because you're so used to it now. So, I mean, that's a really, really good point. No, I was going to say the same as well. I mean, I, I do remember, you know, struggling with that in, when I was in the EHS industry, just trying to get people um, broader than the EHS community. And we, were, we were running marketing campaigns in, internally to try to drive awareness and it, it just wasn't organically happening, right? And, uh, and that's why even Trevor, when you and I started talking, just that that's a big differentiator for you was just that 
you were really just looking where they already go and how do I embed into where they already are and, and extend. And, and that's a, it's a very, very unique way of looking at it. And you kind of bet the farm uh, on, on that, uh, on that approach. And, and, uh, and, it, and, I, and, and, you, and you see it in your adoption numbers. So that's, that's great. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, companies, you know, when they, when they go down that path, um, employees naturally want to be productive. You know, I think sometimes when we're building systems, we think people are all, you know, sometimes we're trying to monitor them. People naturally work and care about the companies that they want to be, do and they want to be productive. And if the tools don't align with that and they actually become a barrier um, yeah. back to usability and accessibility that make the work harder to do, they naturally won't adopt them. But if you can make that completely transparent and just embed it where, oh, hey, I'm doing my job and I'm doing this inspection, but I do a risk assessment with it. Um, that I never did before. And I've been doing this asset inspection for the last five years. And hey, this little piece just got added in. You go, hey, that's a natural way. And by the way, I'm doing my work. I'm collecting the data. And then I'm the byproduct is safety is being handled in a proper way. And we get visibility versus me do my work. And then I go do safety afterwards as an addition to my work. Part of doing the work is actually delivering on the promise of safety. And, and uh, that's again, where you know, you get departments lining up going, I want to be next. I want to implement next because they really care about the company and they want to see that happen. So. Absolutely. No, that's great. Now, and I, I know, I know we, we, we talked about user engagement, we talked about connected application system uh, ecosystems as being, you know, major catalysts for EHS success and adoption, you know, as we kind of, you know, wrap up here, you know, and, and, you know, um, and conclude the segment, you know, what are some of the parting, you know, advice that you'd give to the listeners um, as to how they should be thinking about, you know, you know, accelerating their EHS programs in this given opportunity that we have right now, where there's a lot of awareness towards it. Uh, I don't know, Bill, do you have any kind of, you know, parting words or advice? Yeah, yeah, I think so. uh, one piece of advice is, um, you know, we, we have a lot of these new technologies or we have, you know, we want to integrate this connected safety ecosystem, as we mentioned, uh, and a lot of people want to kind of run before they walk. Um, mm. So you get excited when you see uh, exoskeleton or you see, get excited when you see an industrial wearable. Um, but what, what firms need to do is they need to kind of understand that you need this strong infrastructure and means of managing all these data flows. And EHS software is a great way to do that. Um, if you have a platform where you can integrate in all of these d- different data streams and integrate in all of your different processes into one single sign-on, you know, whether or not it's um, something that's embedded within your existing, you know, Microsoft, that's, that's an opportunity as well. Um, but you need to look at EHS software as this jumping off point, this tool before you start pulling in all these different data streams, because it's going to empower you. You're going to be able to make all of these, uh, you know, insights that you wouldn't be able to with analytics, all these innovations with machine learning and AI that are happening. Uh, so yeah, basically, you know, think really hard about where you want to go, roadmap yourself, but but recognize that you need a strong base, and EHS software is typically that base um, before you make that jump. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so uh, crawl before you run, <laughs> essentially, which is which is a which is an issue. You're right; it's a big issue for many companies. Yeah. Uh, Trevor, how about you? Any any parting words of advice? You know, I guess one of the things I think about a lot is um, I don't think this like safety is embedded in operations, and I needs it needs to be thought about that way. I don't think we should think about it as a separate problem. Um, that silo issue, I think, is 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 really creates uh, might feel good to solve something short term, but I think ultimately you know, the company won't be happy with, with how the deployment or the adoption or those things happen. So to me, I think, you know, safety really needs to be thought about as, hey, what are our core operations? What are we trying to do and how do you embed it? So that that's the way I always look at it. And I think that's the way people are going to go back. And when they make an investment, they're going to come back and say, you know, that was really worthy. Like we really got our bang for our buck. Um, you know, the, in some ways, I think the promise of safety has been a letdown for a lot of companies. And, uh, and uh, I think with cloud, mobile, new platform technologies, new approaches, new kinds of vendors, um, I think there's a real opportunity to tackle that in a different way. So, uh, you know, that's what we wake up every morning trying to do. And, uh, you know, as companies see that, you know, uh, we, we love to talk to them and see if we can help. 
Excellent. No, I mean, I think we can talk about this forever, and 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 uh, and we and we will if we were given the uh, the opportunity. But it, it's time to conclude today. So I just want to thank uh, uh, Bill. Thank you for coming on and sharing your uh, your insight and, and your perspective uh, from all your research and your conversations from uh, with your with your customers. And, and Trevor, thanks again for for uh, you know weighing in and, and sharing your experience as well. Um, and we look forward to uh, you know uh, the next uh, conversation in the series. Thank you, everyone. Thank awesome. you all. Thanks for me.